Let's pray. Let's praise. Lord, I praise you, I love you, I bless you, I adore you, I repent of sin, I renounce Satan, I give you my life, I adore you, and I wouldn't take nothing from a journey now, and I wouldn't take anything from a relationship with you, I wouldn't take anything for hearing from you, I wouldn't take anything from your holy word, your sweet spirit, the blood of Jesus Christ, you who live in us, who live and laugh and love with us. We give you praise. We give you worship. We give you adoration. I repent of sin. I renounce Satan. I ask for your spirit to come on me, anoint me to teach. You know, before I know what I'm going to do, and you know how long you've been waiting to tell me what you told me 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago, 37 minutes ago. I love you, and I thank you, and I bless you, and I adore you. You have poured more into my lap than I am able to receive. But help me, Lord, to be a good manager of what you've given me. Lord, teach me and make us all teachers. Make everybody who hears this now and in the future teachers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Miles Wiley Albright, August 16th, 2021. Um, we'll call Bible in a Bar, Hobbs Island Road, Huntsville, Alabama. I want to tie together some scripture tonight. Uh, this is really, 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 really good. Uh, the Lord has started teaching me this in 1994, April the 12th, as a matter of fact, 1994, about 7.30 p.m. Morgan County, Alabama. And... Uh, <clears throat> And this has to do with the teaching hardening a blessing, which is something that I've, I've been doing, like I say, since 94. Um, but I want to, I like to say that Exodus 17 is the crossroads of the Bible. Exodus 17 it ends, well, it's not where it ends, but it, it's the scenario of Masa Meribah. There's two, there's two encounters at Masa Meribah. There's one 39 years later. But this is the first one. <clears throat> it happened a couple of weeks after uh, the Exodus. And we're going to get to it. And we're going to see what it's got to do with 1 Samuel 15 in particular. Uh, we've been in 1 Samuel 14 for a couple of weeks. We're going to look at 1 Samuel 15 and, and see how they're connected and what God's saying about this. And there's some essential other chapters <clears throat> that tie into Exodus 17. Like I say, I believe Exodus 17 is the crossroads of the Bible. It is for me. Or at least it's one of them. Um. But Exodus 17 is the third of three chapters. It's another one of these triads. You know, you hear me say that a lot of times I believe the Bible is put together in triads. <clears throat> Sometimes it's pairs. Sometimes it's triads. Uh, that happens in Samuel a lot. In fact, 13, 14, 15, which is where we're going, is 15. In both 13 and 15, Samuel rebukes Saul. 14 kind of defines the whole thing, and that's my favorite chapter. And, you know, hey, I wrote a book on this thing. Hell of two hearts. Need to get you a copy. Um, it's about 1 Samuel. But there, it's like 1 Samuel 15 was destined to happen all the way back in Exodus. 
and I'll show you how that's how that is the case. And but to get to chapter 17, we got to hit 15 and 16. Now 15 is brief. The part I want to read, it's not a problem. Chapter 16, I may have a little more problem summarizing that. But then we jump into chapter 17. When we get that, uh, we'll see that David comments. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. The best commentary on what God said is what God says. David makes 500 years after Exodus is written in Psalm 95, he comments on Exodus 17. And so we know what he says is inspired of God and right down to the letter. And so this is an awesome teaching. as a standalone teaching to just teach Exodus 15, 16, and 17 and what Psalm 95, what David said about that. It's hardening a blessing. I've taught that here before. But how that relates into 1 Samuel 15 is where I want to build the foundation again, because I have to. If you've heard this before, I still have to say this to get to 1 Samuel 15 to make it make sense so that you can see the, again, the 40,000 foot view of the scripture so you can see how all these things fit together. Okay, chapter 15 of Exodus, Israel has just come out of uh, Egypt through the Red Sea. Uh, and Pharaoh and his army have been drowned. <clears throat> the song of victory is in the first part of chapter 15. And then there's this <clears throat> about three or four paragraphs here at the end, 22 through 27. And these are really, really important verses because they set the stage for what's going to happen in chapter 17, which casts its shadow across the rest of the Bible. Okay. Verse 22, 1522, then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days, they traveled in the desert without finding water. Now this is only, this has got to be early spring. Uh, Passover has just happened. Passover is March, April, depending on the lunar year. And so this is just days after that has happened. So they were, they were out of water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Marah. Marah means bitter. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Moses cried out to the Lord. By the way, grumbled there is a crossroads moment. They grumbled. They complained. They didn't petition God out of their need and humility. The, the God who had just drowned the most powerful army on earth in the sea. The God they just praised, they grumbled. Really, I believe, because their finances are threatened. These people are not stupid. They can take enough water to last three days for the family, but not for their livestock. And their livestock was their money. I believe that's what's going on. And Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it in the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and there he tested them. Okay, he's testing them. Okay. And the word is nasa or masa or tested. He said, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord, or voice there is tremendously important. Praise God for the written word. But this is the voice of the Lord. This is the same word where Adam and Eve hear the voice of the Lord walking in the garden after they sin and they run. This is the same word where the people at the, in about two weeks, uh, about seven weeks after this, say, we don't want to hear the voice of the Lord anymore. The Hebrew word is call, Q-O-L, that's how we spell it, spell it in English, call. We don't want to hear the call, call, C-A-L-L, -L, or the call, or the voice of the Lord anymore. We'll take the written word, but we don't want to hear his voice. But God is saying, if you listen carefully to the voice. These people didn't have a Bible. But in their heart, in the voice that was in their heart, they knew not to grumble against the God who just delivered them from Pharaoh. They knew that much. This is the pivotal thing. If you listen to the carefully to the voice of Yahweh, your God, 
and do what is right in his eyes. And if you pay attention to his commands, his commands, pay attention to his commands. And will keep all his decrees. I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. He is about divine health, healing, instead of getting sick and having to get well. Okay? This is the only place in the Bible where it says Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. And what it's talking about is, if you're going to try to control me by grumbling, God, God is saying, if you're going, what you're trying to do is you're trying to grumble. Look, yo, this summer, we, I don't think we've had a single 95-degree day. We're in North Alabama. The high today was 89. We've had a lot of days in August and July, a lot of days in the 80s. More than in the 90s, way more, let alone above 95. How many days we had above 95? I don't think we've had any. And everybody say, oh, boy, ain't it hot? No, I, just, I don't even want to do that. I don't even want to grumble that way. I go out and pray every night for God to turn back excess heat and excess cold. And when the temperature is in the 80s in July and August in Alabama, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, no, it ain't hot. Not like it could be. I remember 2012 when it was 105. And it's not 105 now. So anyway, I don't want to grumble at all. Even if it's traditional, boy, ain't it hot. But this rain ever stop. Reckon it'll ever rain. I don't want to complain. I want to trust the Lord. And what the Lord is going to be saying in this hour is trusting the Lord no matter what is rest. It is entering his rest. Even when it's painful, trusting the Lord is rest. Is entering his rest, is becoming one with him. Where you say, look, if I perish, I perish, but I'm not going to complain against you. You just delivered me from Pharaoh. Okay. That was pretty simple, but it was disastrous because they got blessed while they were complaining. I've said this a thousand times, but if a child has a fit for a piece of candy and you give him the piece of candy, you just ruined him. And God just ruined Israel. He's treating them like mature sons that they're supposed to be, giving them what they ask for. But in this case, it's going to ruin them. Ruin them. It is the hardening of blessing. They got the blessing they wanted, but did it make them better or bitter? It caused them to not enter into his rest, to enter into, okay, we know how to control God. We, com we grumble. We complain. And he gives us what we want. And they're setting a paradigm that's going to cause them to die in the wilderness. That's where it begins. Chapter 16. So now they just had the success with grumbling, and they got water. Well, he was going to give them water if they... He's going to do all these other miracles for him. But they think they got it because they grumbled. 16.1, the whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month. Okay, they, so they're exactly a month after they left because they left on the 15th day of the first month. Okay, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Eric. Aaron, key word, grumbled. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around the pots of meat, yeah, in your dreams, and ate all the food we wanted. Yeah, we sat all the time. We weren't, yeah, they were slaves. Ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out in this desert to starve the entire assembly to death, and they're complaining to get him to f feed them and they've got millions of livestock with them. And y'all, to you, a goat don't look like supper. But to them, a goat looked like supper. 
If you got a big family, a big goat. If you got a little family, a kid. Because you got to eat whatever you kill pretty quick or it spoils. That's the way they looked at it. There were no freezers. There was no refrigeration. There was no canning. Sometimes they dried stuff. But in any case, they had plenty to eat, but they figured out, hey, this grumbling works. And so they grumble, and God gives them manna and quail. This is a rather lengthy chapter, and I, I can't, I don't want to get bogged down in this. But he says, I'm going to see if you trust me, because I'm telling you, only gather what you need for one day. If you don't, it's going to, it's going to rot. It's going to get maggots in it. And a bunch of them, they didn't trust God. They were not entering into rest. They were in the struggle. And so they got, went out and got enough manna for two or three days. And guess what? It turned to maggots. And the whole place stunk. And God rebuked them. And then he said, on Saturday, do gather enough for two days. No, not Saturday. On Friday, gather enough for two days. Because on Saturday, there won't be any manna. Because I want you to rest. And it won't rot. It won't get. And don't go out looking for it on, on Sabbath, which is Saturday. Don't go out looking for it. Eat what you've gotten on Friday. You got twice as much on Friday. You take a break. You rest. Well, they still didn't obey that either. They're, 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 they're thinking, well, there's going to be some man out here on Saturday too. And we don't want it to go to, you know, they're greedy. And they go out looking for manna on Saturday when there's not any out there. And God again rebukes them. They're not entering into his rest. He's wanting to provide them what they need one day at a time except for on Friday, he's going to provide enough for two days at a time. They go out and gather double, and that way they rest on Saturday. But they didn't even want to rest on Saturday. They wanted to go out and try to get, get some on Saturday when there wasn't any there. So in other words, they're failing at entering into his rest. And this is, at the same time, it's the first time God gives Sabbath to man. He gives them manna. He gives them quail. But he also gives them Sabbath. It's the first time. Seventh day, starting at sunset on Friday <clears throat> to sunset on Saturday. Stop. Time out. Be still. When the sun goes down on Saturday, start back. Start back where you work. In other words, a, a, a balance of work and rest. It's a picture of entering into rest, but they were refusing to enter into, <clears throat> into rest. Okay. I'm going to skip on ahead here to chapter 17. Again, this is what I think is the crossroads of the Bible, a central chapter to where we're going. Because it's something, something happens that is permanent in chapter 17. There's no going back. David comments later, there's no going back after what happens here in chapter 17. So that in chapter 15, they grumbled and got the blessing they wanted. Chapter 16, they grumbled and got the blessing they wanted. Now in chapter 17, they're going to grumble again and get the blessing they want. And the Lord is going to say through David that they'll never enter my rest because they've done this three times in a row and their hearts permanently hardened. Verse 1, the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. They quarreled. <clears throat> it's a little stronger than grumbled. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test, Nasah? Now they're testing the Lord instead of letting the Lord test them. But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. And they said, why did you bring, the, this, bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? God's not going to let them die of thirst. But he is going to let them get down to the situation where they're going to have to have real faith in the tribulation. Tribulation works patience. Patience, character. But you got to bite the bullet and trust God and enter into his rest and say, if I perish, I perish. If my livestock perish, it just perishes. But in any case, I'm going to trust you, Lord. Period. 
Okay, then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. So they're, they're past grumbling, they're to quarreling. The Lord answered, Moses, walk up ahead of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go, and I will stand there before you by the rock at the Horeb, strike the rock and the water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Masa and Meribah because the, the Israelites quarreled and because they tested. That's Masa and Meribah, the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? That is so crucial. They said, is the Lord among us or not? Is he here or not? Put up or shut up. God, make yourself handy if you want to be our God. Otherwise, forget it. Are you here? We, if you're here, we expect you to serve us. When we need something, show up. That was awful. That was awful. And you might want to put a marker there because we're coming back there. But again, I keep alluding to David by the Holy Spirit. I don't have to convince you that he's a prophet. You already know that. But Peter specifically said David was a prophet in the book of Acts. But anyway, over to Psalm 95, which is quoted and this is treated as, to some extent, I mean, to, in Hebrews chapter 4, Psalm 95 is quoted over and over and over. Psalm 95, Hebrews 4 is quoted over and over again. But catch this, Psalm 95, beginning in the middle of verse 7, today if you hear his voice, okay, uh, voice, voice, we're back to that again, this call. Do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did. Their voice of God in their hearts, they knew better than to test and try. They didn't have the Ten Commandments yet. They didn't have a Bible, but they knew in their hearts by the voice. The same thing Adam and Eve. The voice of God is the voice of Christ in you. It was Jesus Christ walking in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and they heard the sound of the voice walking. He is the voice. He is the Word of God, the living Word of God. He is a person. He is God, and He is the Word, and He is the voice. Okay, again, middle of verse 8, or verse 9, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did, Verse 10, for 40 years I was angry with that generation, and I said there are people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. If you know his ways, you see a test coming, and you know, okay, this may hurt, but bring it on, because I know how faithful he is, and I, when we get to the other side, I want to be standing there for the Lord, if it costs me everything. I want to hear the voice of God if it kills me. Let the righteous one strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is all on my head. Bring it on. That's the knowing the ways of God. Psalm 103 verse 7 says, Moses knew God's ways, but the people only saw his works. Okay, there are people whose hearts go astray. They have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger. This is important. The last verse, they shall never enter my rests. And it's not the word for Sabbath. It's the word for permanent rest, manua. It's the word for marriage. It is the word for what a bride is supposed to find when she gets married. She's got a permanent relationship with somebody who's a protector and a provider. Manua. It's a permanent thing. It's a seven-day-a-week thing. It's not just 24-hour like Sabbath. He specifically didn't say they'll never enter my Sabbath. He said, they'll never enter my manure. They'll never enter into, forget about everything else. If it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever, I am going to trust the Lord. If I perish, I perish. That is entering into rest. That is entering into marriage rest. Married to the Lord seven days a week, the bride being the bride of Christ. I, uh, I and somebody else was at a beautiful wedding this weekend, weren't we? It was very, very special, very holy. I was very blessed, but it reminds me 
of my union with the Lord. So, all right, now, I, I, like I say, my, uh, David is here commenting on Exodus 17, and the question before the house is, will we trust God if it looks like he's not going to show up? Well, that is showing faithful love. That is showing chesed. That is what the Lord says, I desire faithful love and not sacrifice. He's not saying, I desire you to show me mercy. God don't need mercy. He's not even saying, I desire you to show mercy. He's saying, I desire you to show faithful love and not sacrifice. In other words, would you be faithful if it looks like I'm going to let you die? Will you, is it for better or worse, richer or poorer, sickness and health, to death this part? <clears throat> and even death won't, won't, won't let us part, not with Jesus. Now, going back to Exodus 17, and all this is building towards going to 1 Samuel 15. This may be pretty well useless up here, no better than I can write, no better than you can see this reflecting up there. But anyway, this is my main scriptures. But the last scripture before going to 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15, verse 8. Now, this is immediately after, number one, this is immediately after they have said, is the Lord among us or not? Show up, and show out, or forget it. You can't be our God. We done figured out that we grumble, and we get blessed. So we grumble more, and we get blessed more. So now we're going to quarrel, even threaten Moses' life. And now we get a river of water, not a stream like this, a river of water, the Scripture says in Psalms, came out of that rock and filled up a basin there. And they had plenty to drink in their livestock. It took a river. It was a, a miracle of miracles. And they got it by complaining. They thought. There were some standing there. The Levites were standing there according to Deuteronomy 33, and they did not complain. They refused to complain. They said, if we die, if our family dies, no matter what, we're not going to complain against the Lord. We're going to honor his word, keep his cup. And they didn't have their hearts hardened. And they didn't die in the wilderness. I had to throw that in. That's Deuteronomy 33, starting with verse 8. But here, they've entered into toil. And David says, after Moss and Meribah, they'll never enter his rest. And it's, it means that they'll, they'll never live to go into Canaan. They'll never cross the, the Jordan. It doesn't say that right here. It's several chapters later before the Lord says, you're going to die in the wilderness, all of you who have done this over 20, but it was already done in the spirit at that point in time, according to David. They'll never enter his rest after Masa Meribah. It's important. The third time they did this and complained and got blessed, it changed everything forever. Now, this strange little footnote about the war with Amalek. Amalek, the Am Amalekites, Amalek means toil. Amalek means toil. And also, this, this little passage here is the first time we see Joshua. Joshua is a picture of Jesus Christ on a certain level. There's something being said about Jesus, usually when you're reading about Joshua, if you can understand it. Okay. Verse 8, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites tomorrow. I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur, Hur is a man's name, went to the top of the hill, and as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur held 
his hands up one on one side and one on the other so that his hands were made steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Y'all, Amalek means tall. And because of what they've done, there's always going to be this temptation among the Jews to struggle, to struggle by the own strength of their own hand and succeed, God's going to bless them, so they're going to succeed. But so many times they're going to think they did it, like Jacob. Jacob is the perfect example. He, God was blessing him, and he always thought it was he himself creating the blessing all, until he entered Egypt. He thought that. He could not rest. He could not trust. He's the perfect example, and it caused him unspeakable misery and pain. He never entered his rest. And the, the nation is named after Israel. They are the Israelites. And the Israelites are a strong people. There's no people on the earth that are anything like as inventive and creative and productive as the Jews are. None. But unfortunately, they, all, they believe they did it by their power. They're mad at God. They're mad at God about the Holocaust and other things. But they shouldn't be mad at God because they exist. It's like Israel standing beside the Red Sea. They should be dead, but instead of them being dead, their enemies are dead, drowned in the Red Sea, and now they're going to complain against God. Same thing. Israel today is blessed more than any other nation. <laughs> Probably over 50%, over 60 70% of the patents issued in the world are issued to Jews. Nobel Prizes, most of them go to Jews. Anyway, but then the Lord, okay, John, Joshua is the Lord, and the Lord can prevail against toil in our lives only as long as we are standing in faith with our hands raised in constant prayer. The Lord is almighty. Joshua is, represents Yeshua, and he is almighty, but on, he can only do what he can do depending on our faithfulness to stand with our hands raised up before the Lord, surrendered before the Lord, then Joshua wins in the valley. Surrendered before the Lord on the mountain, the Lord will always win in the valley. But if you quit praying, keep quit abiding in the Lord, then he quits winning. It's not that he can't, it's that he, God set it up like this. Now, get this. Verse 14, the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it, this next generation, because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Uh, Amalek means toil. There will be a time when we will enter into his rest that is so complete we cannot remember what it is like when we struggled, when we strained, when we quarreled to try to manipulate God and get stuff. We can't even remember what that's about. That will come. That time will come. But it hadn't come at the time of Samuel, and it hadn't come at the time of Esther. Remember, Esther, her war was with Haman, the guy that wanted to kill her and all the Jews, and he was an Amalekite. You remember that? Okay. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. And he said, For hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against Amalekites from generation to generation. For each generation has to stand and trust God in their generation at their time and enter into his rest to trust him and say we will trust him if we die so because of what's been sown here by the Israelites hardening their heart three times in a row not only are they going to die in the wilderness but they're going to have they're going some of their descendants will survive those under 20 will survive but they're going to be tested from generation to generation about entering into rest. Will they enter into rest? And so when the first king comes, even if he's chosen before he's supposed to be chosen, which is King Saul, he is going to have to deal with certain things in the land left from the previous generation. So in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul has already dropped the ball once 
when he's offered a sacrifice in chapter 13 to keep the people from scattering. The people were leaving him high and dry when they saw how many Philistines were opposing them. So he got scared and, and he did something religious to keep the people from Aerosol, to keep the people from scattering. And he got rebuked for it by the Lord because that's witchcraft. That's witchcraft. Whenever you do a religious thing just to keep people around, keep noses, numbers at church, who is really God? If you're ordering things just to make people happy. The people of God? Or is God God? All right. Chapter 15, 1 Samuel. Samuel said to Saul, it's kind of like he's saying, read my lips. Don't miss this. I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over the people. It's me. Hello. Earth to Saul. Over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from Yahweh, the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up out of Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. This was a demonized people. There was no way to deal with it. The kindest thing you could do to these children was separate them from their demons before they died and hardened where they lived and hardened their hearts because there was no name of Jesus to deal with demons at this time. All this had to happen so there could be a name of Jesus. It's God's way and it's the right way. So, but you got Saul, this guy who's always struggling to look good. Chapter 14, it was sad. He kept snatching defeat from the jaws of victory when God was trying to sovereignly bless him and he kept shooting himself in the foot and his nation in the foot and tried to kill his son even. Entered into witchcraft full bore, acting religious. And what he was doing was struggling, struggling to look good instead of trusting God with what the people thought about him. And now he's going to have to go fight the physical manifestation of the spirit of toil. And he has been failing already, entering into toil to struggle, to try to control things, to make him look good, make himself look good. Before his real God, his real God was the, what the people thought. Okay, then Saul attacked the Amalekites, all of them have a lot of shirts, the east of Egypt, and took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, which is exactly what he was not supposed to do. He took Agag, the king of Amalekites, alive, and his, all his people he totally destroyed but, but the, with a sword, but Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves, lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. They is also the love of money here. It's also the love of uh, what the people think. The people wanted to get these best breeding stock. I know what that's like. I'm a breeder of stock. They wanted them and they want to save these guys, these best. Of, but y'all look, you can believe this or not, but these animals were full of demons. And as long as they were in obedience, to do exactly what the Lord told them to do, which was destroy these demonized people and demonized animals. Remember the pigs that were full of demons? Okay, <laughs> they dove into the sea, right? Jumped off a cliff. Okay. Okay. But as long as they were in obedience, they were immune to these demons coming out of these dead bodies, be it animal or man but they weren't immune as soon as they stopped obeying. So they're bringing these animals back and the king is going to have the main demon of the whole people, the whole nation is going to be in this king. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I am grieved 
that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instruction. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all that night. The word for trouble there is hara, and it literally means angry. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and turned and gone on down to Gilgal. Duh. Okay, it's pretty clear that he cares about what people think about him. He set up a monument in his honor? Golly, come on. Can we be a little more subtle than that? When Samuel reached him, he got all these livestock around. They're being moved. It's like a stockyard. They're going to make a lot of noise. Nah. Ah, and they're mixed with new animals and new circumstances. They're going to be balling. The, the young ones are looking for the older ones and looking, getting separated from their mothers and stuff. Okay. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, Uh oh, the Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, oh, the soldiers, you know, remember what Adam said first, the woman you gave me, blame somebody else. I saw a piece the other day. It says, no man is a failure until he blames somebody else for what he did wrong. Let's see. We got a catastrophe going on now in Afghanistan, but it was Trump's fault, right? Okay. All right. So. Saul answered, the soldiers brought them back from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle uh, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. They didn't bring them back to sacrifice, but he's, he's going to say that right there and probably make it happen to get himself out of this hot water. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And I think there was a pause there for several seconds. And Samuel, Saul goes, tell me. I think it took him a little while to say, tell me. Because he's not wanting to hear this. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. He sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites, Make war on them until you wipe them out. They were a physical manifestation of a spiritual principality. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey. He's not going to repent voluntarily. And all repentance that is real repentance is voluntary. Fair it voluntarily. When you put a gun to somebody's head and they say, I'm sorry, that's no, it's not real repentance. But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. He's trying to save face. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag their king, which is a contradiction within the sentence. The soldiers took the best of the sheep and cattle from the plunder. Okay, you're the king, and you decide what's taken. The best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. ka the hammer falls. It's over. There's no more voluntary repentance because you've been officially outed. So now he's going to repent. But again, repentance is forced. When you repent after you get a gun to your head, you're not really sorry. You're being forced. Repentance like love cannot be forced. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the people because I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. You know, worship the Lord has to be something from the heart. It has to be voluntary. This is not anything like that. He's had the hammer hit him. He's being humiliated in front of his people and what the people think is his God. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Again, he's rejecting the voice of God. He's rejecting the voice of God. That's the theme. He's rejecting the voice of God. Like Adam and Eve hiding 
from the voice of God walking in the garden. As, as Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has tor torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of the people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. He's not asking him. He's telling him. He's jerked him so hard he's tore his clothes. He has entered into force to, in order the people, in order that the people will see, hopefully, him with Samuel and think everything's hunky-dory, but they're not. They can hear. They can see what's really happening. And I guarantee you, word passes fast when there's no, even when there's no internet. But everybody knows that Saul is now a dangerous man. He just threatened Samuel. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. And Saul is going to get what he's asked for. He's going to get a demon, a demon of the fear of man. And how is he going to get that demon? Then Samuel said, bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. This is the guy carrying the biggest demon of the fear of man, of toil in the world. His name is Agag. Agag came to him confidently, thinking, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. So, and, and Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And until the day Samuel died, he did not go see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord was grieved that he made Saul king. He's going, the word is, ah. he knew it was coming. He's not grieved like he's surprised. He's grieved like, yep, this is like I knew. But my point is, is that Saul, because he's the first king, there's a destiny that from generation to generation, especially with the first king, there's going to be this contest. Will you enter into rest? Wise man told me one time, there's only one question on God's test, and that is, do you trust me? Will you trust me? Saul did not trust God at all. He was all about what people thought. And there was toil in that. There was struggle. He was willing to do anything to get the people's approval. And it was a different thing, but it was the same thing with Israel. They were quarreling and complaining in order to get their money protected, their money increased. And the more they did it, the more they believed they could do it and control, them, control God and his benefits. They wanted what God had way more than they wanted God. Now, this is the connection of 1 Samuel 15 in this drastic moment when Saul is officially rejected by God before the people. It's just a matter of time now before he's gone off the scene. He has failed the test of entering in to rest. When David becomes king and he comes to the place where he is, he can be being humiliated before people. I'm keep, I mentioned it before when he sinned and his son Absalom tries to kill him and he's fleeing, David is fleeing from Jerusalem and a man is cursing him and falsely accusing him and throwing rocks and dirt at him. David says, don't bother him. The Lord may have told him to do that. He knew that he deserved worse, and he wasn't trying to save face. He was saying in that action what he said when he wrote Psalm 141, verse 5, let the righteous one strike me. It is chesed, it is faithful love. Let him rebuke me. It is all on my head. My head will not refuse it. In other words, he was saying, I love you, God. Yes, I've sinned. I repent profoundly, deeply. I admit it. You don't have to pin me down. You don't have to force me to repent like 
Saul was forced here and he didn't really repent then. You don't have to force me. Just tell me when David is told about his sin, he said, I am the man. He said, I have sinned. I did it. I did it wrong. And he repents deeply, but he goes toward the Lord. He worships. He prays. He intercedes. He doesn't draw back. He's basically saying, I want God. And even in my sinful condition, I want God if it kills me. And that's been the theme in Samuel with our study so far. Now, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. You're good. We're glad. We trust you. We ask you to help us and change us by the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.